ChatGPT and Gen AI tools have hit the mainstream. The chatter was everywhere, by almost everyone. We feel the discussion has been more philosophical than practical. We know enterprise technologists are using real AI to create efficiencies that result in real business outcomes. So, we created a show to talk to real practitioners about real-world active projects that are leveraging this exciting new technical advantage. Welcome to Live AI. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Live AI. Sticking with the show's theme of real-life enterprise AI use cases, with me today in the live studio is Kurt Vile, a data scientist who spent 30 years in the financial services industry where he has held multiple executive roles. Welcome to the show, Kurt. Thank you, Tony. Glad to be here. I'd love to cover two things for our LinkedIn audience before we get into the bulk of our conversation. Uh, speaking with you prior to this recording, you've led a few very cool AI projects. Which one would you like to discuss for this installment of the show? Um, I, you know, like there's so many things that you can do with AI. Uh, I think I'd like to cover things that are practical. So, so I'd like to talk about how we've used it uh, to manage production issues uh, and to lower response times and resolution for, for issues. Well, and this project has been delivered and is in use. What were the business drivers for this effort? Uh, so, so, you know, anytime you have custom uh, production software, you know, there's going to be issues and downtime is death, right? So, so teams, for as long as I've been in the business, I've been driving to be able to get their software working again as soon as possible, right? And and you've been there, like like you have a, a help desk who's the frontline support. The user calls them. Sure. They're trying to round up the troops. Uh, there's a little scramble. You know, no one knows quite what to do. There's a run book for somebody to look through to it's see if they can resolve in the morning, it. It's three o'clock in the morning. Ten cups of coffee, right? And then <laughs> and then things happen happen multiple times. Uh, and if you and if you think about what you have there, is you you have a set of data. You have all these historical issues. You know what what happened, what the resolution was, like, and what to do. Uh, and then with the advent of Slack, where you know issues get managed through an IM program, and now you have a transcript of what happened, you've got data. And and if you have data and a model, now you can now you have something to work with. Uh, so taking you know taking the data. Uh, and and turning it into embeddings that you can then use uh, cosine ser similarity search on allows you to come at an issue and say, you know, system X Y Z is down with these symptoms, and then you search for that data, and now the model has the appropriate information to help the help desk user because you you've seen every single issue that. And, and every time this has ever occurred, you, you, or anything you, similar to it, right? You've never seen every every issue, but yes, you've seen the you've seen you may have seen something before, uh, and that can help you get to get to clarity sooner. If it happened five years ago, you know, and no one remembers, great. Now you have it, and it's right there, and people can review it. The other thing that 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 we did uh, was. When you have an issue, there's always people who come in wanting updates. Hey, what's the latest? Where are you at? How long is it going to take? Uh, and that, of course, derails whomever's actually working on it. So, so you know, by virtue of having everything in Slack, you know, now you have real-time communications and you have a real-time place where people are coming to ask, "Hey, what's the update?" Uh, so what we what we did is fed the uh, live chat into into Gen AI and have it produce the current status. So now when you come into Slack and look at the channel thing at the top, that's where we're at. So is there like a, a chat bot that was sitting inside there that was already communicating like a recap or something like that back uh, to everybody? No, but that 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 happens now at the end. Mm. Uh, but chat, you know, building a chat bot is pretty simple. Uh, hooking up the chat bot to OpenAI or, or LLM of your choice is also uh, pretty simple. Uh, we did it all in Python. Um, so it, it, it was relatively easy to build and, and quick uh, to get into you know, production. When you, when you think about the, the business process, um, like end to end, how, how did this one become a candidate for you know, pursuing some kind of AI related solution? Uh, this one kind of rose from the bottom, you know, bottoms up. 
So you can you can think of these things as, you know, grassroots or top down. Sure. Uh, and this this one, uh, one of the people on the support staff, was like, thought I could use OpenAI to help me. I can use OpenAI to help me find this stuff faster. Uh, and he, we gave him a, key, a license key, and he started hacking away. And uh, not that much long longer later, he had a viable solution. Uh, and I think there's a good lesson there uh, in that. A lot of this stuff is easy uh, to do, right? And, and if you just need somebody who's sufficiently motivated and, and armed with Python or another scripting language, and they can get a long way uh, on their own, right? And, and once they've once they've you know gotten something that works, then you need to do all the usual things you might do. Uh, but but you know there's a lot of potential power, and I think if you try to do everything from a top-down perspective. You're, you're sort of cutting off all the great ideas for small things that could happen. Sure. How, what was the, the best way that you've seen to, to really capture the imagination and to have people start to self-actualize those ideas right. versus that being a top-down right. approach? Yeah, the, like, like for me, it's been education. So, so a lot of people, you know, they, they, they open chat GP, GPT, they try something, it works, they're like, oh, that's nice, and then you know they move yeah. on, right? And I think I think giving people uh, an idea of what the art of the possible is uh, is important. And if you if you host a training for uh, a set of people, bringing them examples that they find relevant, right, and that they they can then have that light bulb moment where they go, oh, okay, I can do this, right? And I think a lot of people, you know. So see some of the obvious things. Hey, you know, write me a summary of this art article, and they're like, okay, that's all it can do. Uh, but they don't take the next step and say, hey, you know, like this article, what questions should I have of it, uh, and kind of use use the model to help guide them uh, in the process of of doing something, right? And so I think if you if you have that, if you educate people on you know what it can do, then I think they self actualize and start coming up with with ideas. Yeah, we're, we're doing the same thing at Trace3 right now. We've got this uh, program called AI Legends. We're cool. training every single employee over the course of six weeks. There's like some more advanced training that happens later, but um, same concept, which is we want everyone to be bilingual. Their second language is AI. And, you know, we've got a saying at Trace3, all of us are smarter than one of us. How do we, we need people's ideas. And, you know, similar to your example, those who are closest to the problem, you know, how would you reimagine what you do every day or right. this process that occurs or this problem that you have? Like, we need your help, bring those ideas back. Or in your example, you know, put in the work yourself and let's go see yeah. what happens. Yeah. Now, you know, some one of the lessons I think that we learned through, you know, RPA, automation, stuff like that, especially as people thought of the concept mm -hmm. of like citizen developers for the, these kinds of solutions was that, you know, in an enterprise, when things go into production, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be considered. And I think what happened during those times, especially during COVID, is people were rapidly developing things that were taking advantage of automation, uh, especially with remote work and changing the way processes mm -hmm. would work, is that ultimately something would break and no one would realize that Joe over in accounting created this new automated process. No one's supporting it. It breaks. But now the company relies on it because it is in production and no one knows what to do with it, and especially worse if Joe leaves and right. it's just this artifact sitting right. out there. How do you think about how to take those ideas and then organizationally make them more formal and then turn them into something that is actually in production? Right. Yeah, I, I think there's I think there's a sliding scale, right? And so I think I think you know you you don't want to create an environment where it's the wild west where there's no control over any artifact. Right. But the same token, you don't want you don't want a big process uh, that gets in the way of innovation. And so, what I've seen work is a culture where you know I create an automation, I create a Python script, that does a report, or you know, runs some process or whatnot, uh, and the platform you do that on uh, is centrally controlled, centrally managed, and all the code you create goes into a centrally managed place. It's tagged to you. You know, you have to put it in production. You have to have a, a distribution list. You know, and as that grows in importance, you know, that's when it kind of migrates into a formalized 
entity, right? So if you have if you have a script that produces a report for two people and it breaks, okay, that's one thing. You have a script that that uses AI to create a report for a thousand people and that breaks. It's different, sure. Right? And and so you don't that report that two people use can grow into that report that a thousand people rely on, and you don't want to kill off the start, and you want to enable the enable the finish and if you have a data science platform or a software development platform that allows you know the citizen developer or the citizen data scientist and i'm very much of the belief that everyone can code uh that that uh especially today especially today say. like like you know if, 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 you, if you're out there and you have learned... code that does this thing <laughs> sure well, there you go. Yeah, if you haven't <laughs> learned if you haven't learned to use python uh to do stuff just ask chat gtp it, it will it will help you yeah you can do it right and so you want to foster that but as it grows that's when you need to you know more tightly control it and move it into more formal uh, processes as it grows in importance. Yeah, and then democratizing innovation, you just have some kind of framework that people can follow. So like, right. yes, get creative, but as it reaches certain degrees of maturity, then we need to go apply some organizational That's right. structure. That's right. But as but at, at a baseline, you know, everything gets checked in. Mm. You know, everything's centrally controlled. So you don't have the problem that, you know, somebody has an Excel sheet on their home directory. Yeah. And, Right, and then they leave. So experiment, chaos. but experiment in this way. Here's yes. your guardrails, yes. and then if you follow this process, it'll allow everyone to succeed in ways that you know prevents the chaos that, that can occur later. That's right, and 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 you know, like you will, people come up with things, and you know, like you will be surprised by that, right? Like like you know, innovation is 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 a constant, and you know, the thing you need to do is allow people to do it, and I think people who have something they want to do. Uh, that that you know that's not being done today. They will they will make it happen, right? Either working late at night or asking you, you know, hey, can I do this? I think this is a great idea, right? But I think you need to foster that. Uh, and when you do couple that with Gen AI and the ease of actually you know getting things going with it, now you're going to find uh, that you can have real impact on your company's day to day. Uh, based on things that you probably haven't thought of yet. Yeah, I, I love that. I, I want to get back into the solution for a second. Um, before you would have a, some kind of outage situation, you've got tickets, you've got Slack channels, you've got people communicating probably on you know some like war room, conference call or video call, some combination of all these kinds of things. And when you think about before and after, what did that after state look like once some kind of AI related solutions were were uh, involved? And then were there some kind of metrics that you were using to track? Like, how did you determine what success looked like? Uh, you know, success was was mean time to resolution, right? And 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 lowering that, and and you know, I, we definitely saw that impact uh, from from implementing this. Um, you know, and and it just it it came you know, just part of the, part of what happened, right? Like we had long, long before trained everybody to go to Slack to deal with an issue and turned on the bot inside Slack and it did, it did what it needed to do. Uh, so I think, I think, but having that, having that, you know, real business outcome, I think is important, right? So I think a, a mistake that, that I hear people making is, oh, we want to be more productive, but not defining what that means, yeah, right. So, so if you want to, if you want to improve your production issue resolution, you know, I think it's it's great to say I want to improve improve that, but then put the metric around it. I want to take it from an hour to fifty minutes, or on average, or what it, whatever makes sense for your organization. Uh, but driving your AI implementations at business outcomes is super important. So, put me in the in the shoes of I. I, I get pings late at night, there's an outage. I go to sign in, put me in the shoes of, you know, someone troubleshooting an issue. And now what is the after version of this look like from the second I leap in? Right. So, so you're a level one help, help desk person. You're the first, you're the first person to get the issue, right? So the user says, ah, such and such is broken. Uh, and you haven't, you haven't seen this before, or you, you're not quite sure, you're not quite sure what's going on. So then you go and you, you, you try to find the right bookmark uh, in your browser to go to the application, to the run book for that application. Then you open up the run book, 
uh, and you type control F to try and find, you know, some, some meaningful thing and you try to find the right thing and you hope something's in the run book. In this case, user comes into Slack and says, I'm having a problem with XXX and the bot is now going using, using cosine similarity search to find the right document and returning the link to the right place uh, in the run book. So now you're a level one help desk person. Now you have the And this was intervening even before the level one tech you know, hopped on because because it, it's triggered off of the the incidents the right slack right so so yes and so they come to slack and now they see oh okay let me click on this link and go to go to the documentation and maybe that solves it right uh, maybe it doesn't and they have to wake the engineer and they go to pager duty or or, or what have you uh, but but you know at least the process gets started faster right and and then when the engineer comes on the help desk person can say oh well we looked at this and we didn't quite meet that here's the things we see and 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 go on for there so really it just helps kickstart the kickstart the process and hopefully uh allow you to circumvent ever having to wake up other people and at three in the morning now once the engineer hops on they also then have the ability to leverage the same tooling to yeah. look at hey every time something similar like this has ever happened to us organizationally or it happened five years in the past that same bot is also then pulling that information back from like a vector database or something like uh, well, that or the you know the 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 data ultimately lives in sharepoint but you know it, it's indexed uh through a vector database and that's Got how it. it gets found okay are, are you then consuming uh text uh, the text in slack or in real time back into your data storage to also then be leveraged by the bot at the same time yeah, yeah. so describe to me like lightly how, how does how does that work uh so slack has an api uh, and it allows you to 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 uh, you know, download the transcripts or download the chats, and those get put into a document and absorbed into the to the you know quote unquote memory of the of the system. Uh, and in real time, they have a have a way to post messages back to the Slack channel, and so you you know the the bot just listens to Slack and sees when there's a new message and responds with uh, the appropriate thing if it if it needs to. Now, when you when you guys developed this, this was um, was this during like the innovation stage of your relationship with uh, OpenAI? Uh, so, so this 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 was this this was um, a little later than that, but uh, you know, it was one very smart engineer uh, who who decided to take a crack at it and 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 got it done, and then you know it became more mature as as uh, it, you know people went, oh, yeah, this is great, right? Yeah. I guess the punchline with them would be, did you see an improvement in your metrics from mean time resolution? I believe so, yes. All right. So I, I'm always curious around, you know, I, I think of a lot of ideas that are out there and, you know, we, we think, you know, well, what's one better than that? What's the future look like? That sounds like a spectacular foundation for something that ultimately comes the real solution. Where do you think that same solution if you continue maturing it, you know, say right now, a year from now, three years from now, what does that turn into with everything that you know of what's happening in the space? Yeah, that's that 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 that's an that's an interesting question. And it, it's kind of back to the art of the possible, right? So so you know, one of the limitations that that we had when we built that was the size of the context window, right? So with with eight thousand tokens, you really had to have a an economy about the information that you fed the model and the prompt uh, that you constructed because you know the 8,000 tokens was both not only your prompt but also the, re the return. Sure. Right, and, and now as, as context windows get larger and larger uh, and you see more and more startups building software that understands code bases, now you can, now you can imagine a future where bot that's helping you with the production issue is also going to be looking at the code base you know trying to find the 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 bug in the code base or the configuration you know what well, that might be a miss or whatever it might be but you know having having that having the model have more ability to absorb more information will allow you to do more and more things uh, and have have the reach be further and further uh, so so I think I think that might be uh, an interesting future where where the model is really trying to solve production issues without having people engaged. Yeah, well, and I think you just said the key point because 
I feel like a lot of what we're doing today, uh, especially in the Gen AI space, is to um, help people do things a little more quickly. But I feel mm -hmm. like in human nature, we don't actually want to do less. We want to do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and if you can, and, you know, your, your, your army of bot slaves that are sitting out there, you know, uh, taking care of all these things for you, you know, how does this intervention occur? And I think you made an interesting point there because you've got context window within a single instantiation but then the concept of you know a swarm of agents that are right. assisting something right. like that now opens up this world where that user i've got this issue this thing happened mm -hmm. to your point now it's scouring the the, the run book and understanding intent but then unleashing all these other activities so that that by the time that tier one person intervenes maybe they never intervene they just see a closed ticket with all the history that's in it because it's already been solved right yeah yeah you know i, I my dream of doing nothing is uh, it's not <laughs> it's not happening anytime soon. Uh, and and I think there's I think there's an you know, I think I think it's it would take a brave organization to, you know, use Gen AI in a fully automated uh, fashion. Right. Right. With no with I think I think the maturity of the of the technology, you you know, in the majority of cases you still need a human in the loop. Right. Uh, which which makes it great for things where you have four eye checks where two people are looking at something or you know maker taker maker checker kind of relationships, uh, but you can't imagine a future where uh, one model checks another. You know, hey, does this document say this? You know, and then have the other models confirm that hey, that actually says that, right? Like so, you could you could see that happening, uh, but you know, I don't think we're at the place where you know it can make allow people to do nothing <laughs> not yet <laughs> yeah. well to your point i mean you mentioned something before and you and i've you know had many discussions coming from the background that you do in financial services that ultimately in financial services things need to be repeatable and one of the problems with just handing things over to ai today especially with the way gen ai might interpret text and tension and as we get into video and audio and all the things is that you can't actually guarantee the same result is going to happen right. every time. Well, and that's and like for for systematic or quantitative trading strategies where, you know, a a piece of software is making the investment decision, buy this, sell that, uh, you you absolutely have to have repeatability. Right? You can't you you if you have one set of inputs, you always have to get the same result. Uh, and firms go to great lengths uh, to make sure that that's the case, and if there's a client question, that they can they can actually answer that. Uh, so Gen AI, you might give it uh, a prompt in the morning and get one result, uh, and give it the same prompt in the afternoon and get something totally different. Uh, so you know, in terms of using it for systematic sort of trading decisions, you know, like that's that's a big problem. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm not sure I'm not quite sure how you how you solve that one. Now, if you want to use it to inform uh, what you're doing, you know, summarizing information, extracting information, synthesizing information across multiple sources. Great. Humans still in the loop. Right. But, but that last mile, uh, I just don't, I don't know that the technology is there yet. Yeah. Kurt, when you, when you were thinking about the solutions that, uh, you all built, and, and I know that in earlier conversations that you and I've had, you were at the forefront of the the, innova the innovation license that was open for, uh, this is before like the public release of uh, ChatGPT uh, yeah. 3 in uh, November of 2022. Yeah. And could you describe, I mean, you've had a front row seats to a lot of change that's occurred in a very short period of time, but you know, well ahead of the curve of most of the rest of the world. I just love to hear just your experience from like the innovation license and how you saw the technology and to you know, what's happened today. Yeah, it even, it even started way before then. Uh, you know, NLP has been around for, for a long time. Uh, there was a, before GPT-3, uh, there were BERT style models and there was one specific to the uh, financial industry called FinBERT and we use that for various things. Uh, but when we got a hold of GPT-3, uh, it was immediately apparent that this was a step change uh, in what you could do with with NLP, uh, and then it was it was also sort of apparent that uh, this wouldn't be the only one, right? So so 
you know, OpenAI created this technology, but you know, you, 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 there were grumblings in the world of others. Uh, so, so we we created a platform uh, that would allow us to easily A B things, right? With the view that some models will do great with one thing, other models will do great at another thing, and you need to just switch between, be able to switch them between them. And now, as the pace of new models increases and and new things are coming out all the time you know like having that capability is even more uh impactful because you can take one project you built uh that you know the performance of uh, and if you and if you've uh architected it well now you can just switch this other model and see how it does and if it does better uh and better as a relative term of course <laughs> uh you know then then it's easy for you to switch and so so i think what what the model can do today, uh, you know, in a year, you'll, it'll be sort of the same distance uh, from what the models could do last year. You know, just an unbelievable kind of step change. Uh, and I think that will continue for a while. So I think it behooves you to construct your software that way, right? In that, make it easy to switch, make it easy to, to re-engineer prompts. Make it easy to change how you source your data, right? And 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 continue to treat it as if it's going to evolve because it will. Any any key advice then, if you were architecting a solution today, understanding that capabilities of even existing models are changing in, in versions and in weights and continuously morphing. Um, I know some organizations have consumed a, a version of a model that's been frozen in time. Yeah. Um, how do you think about architecting an application that allows you that kind of flexibility? And then what ramifications are there in the development process? Is it just the same as always, just like just another component of code or a new you know, microservice that you're consuming and you know, standard testing? Or do you test differently? How, how do you think about that whole process? I, I, I think, I think you know, they, they all essentially work the same way, right? So it's easy for you to construct a facade or there's plenty of open source projects out there that have, have built... Uh, the capability to talk to multiple models, right? So I think I think those are taking that approach is a is a good thing. Uh, and then you know in terms of measurement, you know we've we've developed data science techniques for the past you know fifteen years of how to take some model and measure measure its quality against what other whatever objective you're trying to achieve. And it, you know Gen AI is the same. Is the same is the same, right? Like like you design your metrics that you would to test any model. Uh, you set your boundary conditions and you monitor it in production to make sure that it's still performing at the level that you want. And and you know I think you treat it like you would uh, anything else that comes from the AI ML world. Something something that struck me when you were talking about that, and you were talking about you know architecting and, and components that allows you to swap the you know the model out. And then it just got me thinking about the data itself, and then back to your use case because you know data security is a is a huge topic mm -hmm. right now, and when we're doing you know red red teaming of some some kind of chat Gen AI related technology, uh, one of the things that we look at is you know can we leap guardrails? Can we poison the mm -hmm. data? And have you given any considerations to those kinds of things? And when I go back to your use case. You know, is that does that become another attack surface and a target where if I've got all your tickets, I've got all the text, I understand one, I can use your bot to reach into your entire environment, but can I also you know poison your environment by right. altering runbooks or changing the process? And now it's just consuming whatever data is in there. And you know, how how do you think about the sensitivity levels of those kinds of things? Uh, yes, you, and you you could you could you could in the old world too, right? Like you know, the runbook is just on a SharePoint page. So sure, somebody could poison it by hacking in and changing your short SharePoint page. I don't know that that will uh, bring them very much fruit, but I think I think I think you do need to manage this data uh, in a in a different way than you do uh, relational data. So one 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 example might be. Uh, say you're say you're researching a company, and you have you have information that comes from news, you have information that comes from company press releases, from their 10K filings, from their earning transcript calls, and you have a bunch of different 
information and then you it's also in a in a time series right it happens so you might want to you know you you might have some tasks that you want to do that you want to only include news or only include filings and earning call transcripts or or whatnot uh, so the metadata around the information you have uh, is important right so you can you can narrow what you're searching over uh, to just the appropriate things for for that search uh, but then you know by having all these sets of data you also need you know security and and privileges to to make sure that people who shouldn't be seeing certain sets of data aren't right so i think i think sort of the good practices uh, for data apply but you do need to manage it in a in a in a slightly different way than you would a relational database Kurt, I know we're uh, running short on time. Any last words of wisdom or anything we didn't cover that you want to address on this episode? Um, I'm, you know, like like the the cost of trying uh, for for these models and failing is really low, right? And I think a lot of people try something once and then you know are like, oh well, that didn't work. Uh, and I think I think if you try stuff. Uh, and it doesn't work, so what? You wasted a minute. If you try stuff and it does work, you know maybe it'll lead you to something that saves you a lot of time or you know, enhances the productivity or saves costs, right? So uh, my, my advice for folks is just try, right? And, and you'll probably be surprised about, uh, by what uh, pops out. Fantastic words of wisdom. Craig, this has been a great conversation. Uh, would you mind coming back for another episode? Sure, no problem, anytime. You've been listening to Live AI. We hope you've enjoyed the conversation. This episode is sponsored by Trace3. To learn more about why you should connect with them about your enterprise practical AI use case, visit them at trace3.com or look for them on LinkedIn. Thanks for listening.